Good morning, class. <clears throat> Feeling pretty good, in case you're wondering. Um, the last lecture here, last part of chapter four, um, before you have all the information you need for this test. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, finish up this last part. All right, so let's get right at it. And really, at the end, I'll talk about some things about mutations and um, which are important for a lot of genetic diseases. Like I just talked about cystic fibrosis. And so uh, I'll make sure I get to that, but uh, transcription and translation. So these things, again, review, you guys have had this in biology. So I'm just gonna go through it. Just make sure you guys are just crystal clear about that. So, first of all, transcription is like a court transcriptionist that takes down every word that's said in the courtroom faithfully. That's what you want to do. You want to take down every letter that's in the DNA and make a copy of it. And uh, that's your transcript. So, the gene has to be, you need to know where it's at. It's got to have a beginning and an end part to it. You got to be able to find it. And then um, you're going to uh, make a copy of RNA. And so there's a beginning part of this promoter sequence that uh, says, dude, this is where it starts. And you gotta start in the right letter. Because if your, uh, your frame is off by one letter, nothing makes sense, right? It has to be just right where you start. And uh, this um, enzyme will be RNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is how you copy DNA. Polymerase means you're making a polymer. So RNA polymerase is how you make RNA. It's gonna be this messenger RNA. So it's gonna bind this messenger, um, this RNA polymerase, and it's gonna run down it, and it's gonna put the correct letters like that to make this RNA. And you know some things about RNA. You can see it's only single-stranded, right? Um, and the other thing is it's a U instead of a T. And then has a different sugar too. So it's D DNA, deoxy, ribose versus ribose. That's not important right here. So it runs down, uh, makes a, a copy of this thing, and there's got to be a termination sequence, a stop sequence, so it knows where to stop. And then it's done. And this DNA will, uh, will, will, will wind, unwind to be copied and wind up behind it. And so you're making a copy of this valuable recipe without risking <clears throat> taking that original recipe and using that to make the red, to make the cookies, right? And so once this RNA is red, once it's made, it floats off. And then in, in us, in eukaryotes, we'll put a, a cap and a tail on it. We'll even do some editing, right? We'll take out introns. So we do a little modifying of it after we make that original uh, messenger RNA, and then it's sent out, sent out to the uh, cytoplasm where we'll find a ribosome and we'll make a protein. So what do you think about transcription? The basics. RNA polymerase is going to make it. It's going to have a start and a stop sequence. It's going to have to unwind so it can be read, but then it's wind up behind it. And then that messenger RNA is going to be edited captain tailed, and then that's going to be the message, the recipe that's going to make the protein. How's that? Now, translation is like translating a language, Spanish to English, something like that. So going from the language of A, C, T's, and C, A, C, oh my God, A, T, C's, and G's, to the language of amino acids, 20 some amino acids, right? So, completely different language, right? So you're translating it. And so above, on top here, is that messenger RNA. So there it is, and you can see the letters. You notice U's, that's where there's a, a, a T in DNA, right? Um, don't wanna try to distract you with that, but, um, and then what comes along is that you need to know where to start 
and then these transfer RNAs, see that tRNA? They're the ones that are gonna carry the appropriate amino acid based on these uh, sets of three letters called a codon. So we read the messenger RNA in groups of three. And that's the key, there's a, there's a code what those groups of three, what amino acid that translates to. And so you read it in groups of three. These transfer RNAs are all floating around. They come in and stick to it and they deliver. They're carrying that correct amino acid. So whatever their, it's called the anticodon, whatever their letters are that fit, that, that's going to be that amino acid. It's going to be uh, carried there. So what's going to be added to the, the protein. So you screw up a letter, you get the wrong amino acid, it could screw up the protein, something like that. So it has to be read correctly, et cetera. All right, so groups of three, huh? Yeah. Could it be groups of, why not just read one? Well, if it's only read by ones, you'd only have, be able to have four amino acids, right? Yeah. And uh, two would not be enough, because you go um, two, well, what's the math of that? there'd be 16 possible uh, variations. And with three letters, you would have 64 possible variations. If you have three, codons made up of threes, and uh, each one has um, um, four possible letters, 64 total, which is more than the amount of, uh, than you need, but two is not enough. You only have 16 options. So if we only read it in twos, you can only have 16 amino acids. We got like 20, so that's why it's gotta be three. And uh, yeah, these codons are, are groups of three and that's uh, what we read to translate into what amino acid is gonna be stuck on what makes that beautiful enzyme or that beautiful hormone or beautiful keratin in our skin. It's gonna be that recipe, the right, um, the right amino acids put together in the right sequence. And because <clears throat> there's a redundancy, because we're using uh, three letter, three codons, three, uh, I'm trying to say, three red in groups of three that have the letters on there. Since red in groups of three, there's actually 64 possibilities, so it's called redundant. There's several different codes for one amino acid. All right, let me give it to you. So. It's actually a lot of work went into figuring out this code of life. It's like the Rosetta Stone. This is how uh, we're translating the letters in our DNA to the proteins. I think you guys are ready. All right, we're expecting more? Well, anyway, this is it. Long experiments went into uh, uh, figuring out that UUU is gonna make uh, phenylene or phenol, who knows, something with a PHE, right? And a UUA is going to make a leucine. I don't know. Yeah, so see those groups of three letters equal those amino acids. And then a special one uh, um, is AUG is the start. And that means I think it's school starts in August. You guys learned that. But so that's always going to be the start. And there's several, you don't have to know what the stop codons are, but School starts in August, so AUG is always the beginning, and it sets the frame so that you're reading it correctly. So AUG starts it, and then the next three, the next three, the next three. And what you may notice is that, you know, for this leucine, there's, um, well, there's more than that. There's an R gene or over here. So see how it's redundant? You can have any one of those, CGU, CGC, CGA, CGG. They all are going to equal that amino acid. You guys notice anything about which letter position is maybe not that important? It can be more variable. Yeah, that third letter position doesn't seem to matter as much. It, does, it matters in some cases, but not as much, right? Yeah, that's true. That third letter, you still need it. Uh, you can't do it with two letters. Like I say, the math is only 16 combinations. So you need three letters, but it sets up this redundancy which also means um, when you talk about mutations that if you imagine you have a mutation that changes the third letter, we won't care as much, will we? So in this case, if it's CGC was what you had in your gene, and all of a sudden that C turned to an A, oh no, mutation, it doesn't matter. You'll never notice the difference because it codes for the same thing. 
guess. But you change the first letter, now instead of CGC, your AGC, then that R gene is like a serine or whatever that is. That also might not kill you because maybe it just makes it a little funky, but sickle cell anemia is one letter difference, different amino acid, it behaves differently, you've got this disease, right? Cystic fibrosis, I actually don't know how many letters, but you change some letters, wrong amino acids, the, the pump that pumps sodium doesn't work and you end up with mucus in your lungs. So can make a big difference, but in many cases, mutations can be silent where uh, you change a letter because there's that redundancy there. All right, there's the code. You don't have to know, memorize these. God, I hope it's not a class. You have to memorize all these, right? AUG August is the start. Know that one. All right, so yes, um, when you do this translating, you have these transfer RNAs, which are these things. And then, then floating around in the cytoplasm will be one for each of the amino acids. So all these different kinds uh, will have to all be floating. They've got to be charged up with the right amino acid. And this translation takes place. You can see, here's the start codon, AUG. So the opposite or anti-codon will be on that transfer RNA, it'll stick to it. It's gonna fit like a, a lock and a key, it's gonna fit. And then by then it's brought that amino acid, it's gonna release that. And then it's gonna move to the next position. And the next one's gonna come and it's gonna attach the next amino acid on. So all translation is taking place. And you need to know, of course, it happens on the ribosome. So the ribosomes are out there and uh, the messenger RNA, it's been uh, transcribed out in the cytoplasm. It finds a, a ribosome. The ribosome moves down it really rapidly and transfer RNAs come in. You see there's like these three positions, they come in and they're gonna deliver the correct amino acid. And it's just put in the right position so that it binds with the one in front of it and it makes this long like bead, beaded necklace. It's gonna come off. We call it a polypeptide chain, but once it comes off and starts folding, it becomes a protein. Awesome. And believe it or not, this messenger RNA is it's running, it's, remember they, they can be huge, it can be hundreds of thousands of codons long. You can have one running, have another one behind it. And so it may, they can, they can, so these messenger RNAs can be read over and over again. Eventually they wear out, you're gonna make a new one, but uh, they, uh, they are read rapidly. You can have two reading at the same time even, or several. Yeah, and so it'll keep going, it'll keep going to the very ends. And then uh, the ribosome will break, oh, break apart and then the protein will float away and it will begin being uh, modified. <clears throat> All right, so translation happens on the ribosomes and the cytoplasm. So on the rough ER, there's ones floating around too. And that's where uh, the message from the gene is translated into the protein. That's what the genes are doing, they're making these proteins. All right, so this is a beautiful thing. Look at this and make sure you get it. Uh, on top is your DNA and your nucleus. It's got all of your genes in it, all of your instructions. They're, protected in there. And uh, you can read one of the others. It doesn't matter, they're complementary, but we call one the template strand because it's the template. So you read one or the other and um, it's gonna be read where you put the correct opposite letter on and then we have U's instead of T's in the, R in the RNA, right? And then it's gonna make this messenger RNA. The messenger RNA, if you look at the original DNA, oh yeah, okay. It's gonna equal that coding strand because it's the opposite of the template strand. Yeah, yeah, I copied it pretty well except I put use. See that? Put use instead of the T's. Well, otherwise, beautiful copy. And in bacteria, you, you, you use that. But in us, we're gonna, the messenger RNA will be spliced, pieces we cut out and we'll put it together. It'll be smaller, but um, that's gonna be our, our recipe. Cool, and you can see, uh, it's the reading frame is started by that AUG and then you read, read every three. Because if you're one letter off, it's nonsense, right? Because you're reading different letters. You know. And the stop codon tells you to stop. And then translation happens. Look at the big difference here. That's where you're translating this uh, type of alphabet of these letters 
into amino acids. Yeah. And that's what a protein is. It's a long string of amino acids. And then it's going to fold and turn into cool shapes of your enzyme or whatever you're making. But uh, basically, it's going to be a string of amino acids. And it, it matters which ones are which because they have different properties. And so it's going to make a different protein depending on what the recipe is. I would ask if there's any questions, but how could I answer them? You're watching this. But if you have any questions, of course, uh, read the chapter, you know, go over say, so you, you feel good about translation and uh, uh, transcription. And, um, or yeah, send me an email, I'm happy to help you. All right, then a few things here, we'll talk about some mutations and then where we're at with uh, um, genetic therapies and genetic diseases, because we'll talk about them throughout the year. So a mutation uh, sounds, it sounds bad, right? Because we think about all these diseases, right? But honestly, mutation is the only way we get new genes, new alleles. And uh, it's the only way we have evolved. Evolution doesn't take place without mutations. And so all the things, these blue eyes, the, uh, my big brain, all this happened through mutations um, that happened in the past. And so natural selection can act on them. So while you think mutation, you think, oh, I've been exposed to radiation, I'm gonna have a cancer disease, realize it's also a process of, uh, of building differences in evolution too. So it can give you favorable outcomes. Usually not. You know, why do I say that? I'm imagining, imagine your car and you're saying to yourself, I wanna um, improve it. Would you take a shotgun with a slug and just shoot the engine? How do you think that would do? Well, the engine was carefully put together by engineers. You imagine you could hit something, you just screwed up your engine, right? But there's a possibility that you, you nicked an air hose or something. Again, I'm not a mechanic at all. But imagine like it added a little more air to the fuel mixture, started running better. So occasionally, shooting your car um, engine can make it perform better. But usually, you've hit something <laughs> that's been put together carefully, and uh, yeah, it's not good. And a lot of times, if you shoot the car uh, engine, you, nothing happens, it's neutral, because it misses everything. There's spaces in there, or it hits something solid, I don't know. So think of it that way, mutations sometimes are good. Another thing I wanna mention is that in mutations, let's imagine a mutation happened to your DNA. Realize that only 2% of your DNA codes for something right? 90% is junk DNAs. Remember that? And so you can have changes in letters all over the place. That will make no difference. Who cares if it's over in that nowhere's land? It's never going to be right. You're going to copy that mistake forever. And uh, you know, it's made a mistake. It's going to be different, but who cares? You don't read it. So it's got to be within the genes. And then as we just learned, even if it's in the middle of a freaking important gene and you change the letter, Sometimes it doesn't matter because the amino acid is the same. And so you've changed the letter, you have not changed the product. And sometimes, even if you have changed the amino acid, the protein still works. But in many cases, like sickle cell anemia, one letter change changes so it's a different amino acid and you end up with this disease. All right, so that's my, your big picture on mutations, these changes in letters, it doesn't have to be a change of letter, it could be a, where pieces are moved around, but some kind of change in your DNA. And just as a cool example of a genetic mutation, this myostatin uh, deficiency is where you, uh, you don't make this, uh, uh, this limit on growing your muscles. And I'll just show you, look at this. He says he's usually skinny little dogs, right? Look at the muscle on that, I could kick your dog's ass, right? Um, you think, oh, I want one of those. Well, heart muscles enlarged, so it's not great. And look at these cattle. Look at the glutes. Look at the glutes on this cattle, right? Yeah, so anyway, it's a cool example here of a, of a mutation. Um, you don't want a steak from one of these. You know, you, we like, if you want a nice juicy steak, you don't want the athlete of the group that's been running laps around the barnyard. You, you want the lazy one, because the more fat that's invested in the muscle, the more juicy the steak is, the more tender it is. So. Anyway, this looks like hamburger here to me. All right, so mutations, again, tend to be disruptive. Uh, and then you look at the mutation rates, you can Google that if you want. Uh, it's, it's, they're pretty rare events. 
uh, we make few mistakes when we're copying. And remember, talking about copying our DNA, imagine 3.2 billion letters you copy, and you copy millions of times a day, millions and millions, all your skin cells, your blood cells. You're making copies with very few mistakes. And so these are trillions of letters copied. It's just, you know, it's amazing we do this with so few mistakes. So what causes mutations? I think you realize uh, toxic chemicals. So smoking is huge, uh, and showing sun damage and, and x-rays, things like that. Um, indeed, uh, I think you know that. They're gonna change, uh, uh, change your DNA. You guys can, can limit your risk, but you can't eliminate the risk of mutations happening. So, uh, for the rest of this, this class, when we talk about uh, pathologies, a lot of genetic diseases come up. We've already talked about Tay-Sachs disease, cystic fibrosis, I was talking about sickle cell anemia quite a bit, but yeah, these are genetic diseases. And uh, what usually happens is that there's a change in a letter. It's in the middle of a gene where it changes the amino acid, so it changes the protein, and it changes it enough so that it doesn't function. Even lactose, those are your lactose deficiencies. If you don't make that enzyme right, it's not life-threatening, but uh, you notice that. So proteins have to be the right shape, just the right shape. And by changing the amino acid, it changes the shape and uh, it may no longer work. And so these, these mutations, you know, if they're genetic, um, uh, you get it from the parents, of course. Um, you can have mutations in your own body, all the ones you get when you live, realize they die with you. They die with you, unless they happen um, to your sperm and eggs, and then they passed on. But uh, most are mutations in our body, whether you know, we're, so we're smoking or getting sunburned. Uh, we get cancer, we get changes in mutations that happen, but they die with us. They have to happen to the germline to be carried on. But those mutations in our germline you know, are famous causing genetic diseases hemophilia among the royals of England or a sickle cell and all these things. All right, so, so let's just, you know, kind of big picture here. We're finishing this first section here, talking about biotechnology, how we can work with genes uh, for human health. And it turns out we're really good now, or we're getting really good at identifying um, genetic issues that cause diseases. So we started to make this category of oncogenes. I okay, see so we're reviewing here. Uh, genes that we know um, lead, can lead to cancer. And so we're, we know where to find if you're you know, sickle cell. We, we uh, uh, take babies and take blood immediately to look for this PKA issue. We look for genetic diseases early on because if we, we know we can catch those, we can uh, um, uh, do some lifestyle changes and not have a disease. So anyway, we're pretty good at that. What we're not good at is curing genetic diseases, you know? Why do we have people with cystic fibrosis and, and um, sickle cell anemia? If we know the problem, we know the letter changes, we know the mutation, well, why can't we get in there and fix it? Yeah, that's where we're really lacking. And we can put a gene from an um, Arctic fish into a tomato plant and it makes the tomatoes frost resistant, you know? And we're really good at modifying, especially well, bacteria and plants. Turns out when we look at humans, and it's hard to do research on humans, but animals, uh, um, it's really difficult to, to make the changes just where they need to be made, you know? Let's say you wanna change that letter, that A, it's in sickle cell anemia is bone marrow, a patient. But, uh, you know, getting in there and not causing cancer and other changes and just changing what you need to change is, is, is a big challenge that uh, we haven't solved yet. <clears throat> All right. So indeed, the curing diseases is where uh, human genetic disease is where we're just not there. Uh, you know, if you think of all things we can do is that we, we can identify the disease, but then we have a hard time curing it. And then GMOs, genetically modified organisms. And, I'll give you my opinion, of course you can have your own, uh, is that uh, GMOs are not as scary as you think. We've been genetically modifying all of our food for thousands and thousands of years. It's just we do it a slower, now we can do it a little more quicker, right? Um, 
And uh, the risks, of course, it sounds scary, you know, playing God, moving genes around, but again, there's really, uh, if, if you want to look for actually any GMO food causing any kind of health issue, you're going to have a hard time finding something. Uh, so it's just not, and even if, even if um, you're worried about it, the genie's out of the bottle. This is 10 years ago. You know, 85% of our soybeans, I mean, it's bigger now. So sure, you can get non-GMO and it sells a lot because people are, can, are scared of it. Um, but genetically modifying, we're able to put genes against pest resistance, things like that, instead of using pesticides into the corn so that it's there. And so again, my, my opinion is that you can have your own, is that uh, genetically modified foods are the future and it's going to happen. And so I'm um, sure it's scary at first, but that's my thought. This uh, chicken has been modified not to have feathers. That'd be easier not to pluck it, but get sunburned, doesn't it? So think about that. All right, and last slide, um, talking about uh, uh, cloning and gene therapy. Like I said, there's a real issue. And so this boy in a bubble reminds me of, of, of some of the problems we're having. So you know this kind of disease where um, the patient uh, has to be kept in this bubble. And if they go in the real world, they're just, they have no immune system and they get sick really easily. Um, so the, we tried this, we tried, okay, let's take out the cell, stem cells from the bone marrow and let's get in there and fix them and put them back into the bone marrow and maybe they'll have a normal immune system. So they did this, uh, a small 10 or so patients, um, and there was some promise. Like, oh my God, these people are making antibodies, uh, to be able to get out of the bubble. But then a couple of them got leukemia, you know? It's, and so when you start at a percentage, you, you're giving kids cancer, they, they stopped, you know, you can't ethically keep trying this therapy when there's, you know, it's that, there's that danger. So again, there's a, some promise and then um, we just don't have it figured out. And cloning, uh, people are afraid of clones. Clowns too, that's a different story. But really, it's just as scary as having an identical twin. That's what it is. So they're not identical to you. They're a hell of a lot like you, but you know, there's, if you guys are identical twins, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but of course, you know, there's ethical th issues, you know. Um, do you, in the future, do we clone half a dozen of us, maybe without brains, and just keep them on life support so we can harvest their organs? That doesn't seem right. It doesn't sit right with me. Um, but if you guys lose a prize cat or something, you can pay like six figures and they can clone it. Uh, I'd sell you a cheaper cat for sure. Um, so we've cloned sheep and cats and, and cloning people. We don't do that in the U.S. and most countries, and so I, uh, we have not done that, but we certainly can. It's, it's not that hard. But anyway, all right. So this is a big chapter. Yes, well, it uh, seems like we've been doing this a while, uh, just for chapters one through five, but I'm finally done lecturing on chapters one through five. And I hope you guys have read that. Yeah, you've read them, you've listened to my lectures, you've taken some notes. And I'm impressed a lot of you are very serious students in this class, and that's great. And you recognize, you know, this is A and P is something for my future. It's something, you know, this is the background I want to know. And so uh, my next lecture, we'll talk about skin and uh, greats to hair and nails and tanning and all this great stuff like that and, and color and hair color and so good stuff. Um, and then right to bones. So, all right. Hope you guys are all doing well. Um, uh, I guess that's it. I'm gonna get this out there for you.